Thank you for joining us today in Jennifer Schaus and Associates' complimentary webinar series. We're coming to you live from Washington, D.C. today. This year on Fridays, we're covering procurement playbooks. We will take a deep dive into doing business with the agencies and departments with our panelists. On Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern, we will cover the FAR supplements and our four procurement regulations for the agency and departments. Fridays, we will cover the business development and marketing aspects of the corresponding agency and departments. The full schedule and the sign-up links are on our website. We'll also be hosting a complimentary webinar on what federal contractors need to know about COVID-19 mandates on Thursday, March 17th at 12 p.m. Eastern. The registration link is provided below. And in addition, on March Monday, March 28th from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m., we'll be hosting an in-person networking event at the John F. Kennedy Center, uh, the KC Cafe on the terrace level. The uh, registration link is also provided below. Uh, we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Virginia PTAC at GMU offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. If you are interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore what PTAC can offer. And a special thanks to our sponsor, the Federal Business Council. The FBC creates and manages virtual and in-person meetings and events to connect appropriate industry and government thought leaders, product providers, and solutions with government programs that use them. The FBC works with mission-specific programs for a variety of agencies to connect government and industry in the form of in-person and virtual conferences, training events, policy dialogue, and outreach. Over the last 40 years, FBC has become a comprehensive resource for connecting industry and federal government. We would also like to thank C3 Integrated Solutions. C3 is a full-service IT provider helping DOD contractors achieve CMMC 2.0, DFARS, and NIST 800-171 compliance through cloud-based solutions, including Microsoft 365, GCC, and GCC High. Today, we will be covering doing business with DISA. Uh, let's meet our panelists. Uh, we want to thank our friends from FedMine. This is Archisa Mahan. Archisa, it is great to have you with us today. It's uh, great to be here. Um, my name is Archisa Mahan. I am the Senior Product Manager at FedMine, uh, a GovSpend company. And i um, happy to be here with uh, you and with the McLean Group. Thank you, Archisa. And uh, this week, unfortunately, we were not able to get a contact from DISA although we will be providing information on how to do business with DISA in the following presentation. And we would like to thank the McLean Group for joining us today and providing an M&A perspective on the movers and shakers within the agency. Thank you to Paul for joining us today. Thank you. Okay, and now we will move on to business opportunities and outlook. Arcisa, the floor is yours. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, so FedMine is, uh, federal market intelligence company that basically integrates the 18 federal data sites into one easy to use, use platform, um, allowing reporting and analysis, which was not previously possible. We are now part of GovSpan, which is the largest provider of uh, data and um, purchase orders in the state, local, and education market. So. We now are a one source uh, data provider for federal and the sled market. I am excited to talk about DISA today. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. So DISA, as we all know, is the premier IT combat support agency and trusted provider to help connect and protect the way for warfighter in cyberspace. Uh, what I did not know is that actually the agency reports to the DOD CIO. And it is, you know, and part of what they do is, is uh, provide enterprise level IT capabilities and services to the nation's leaders and warfighters and uh, mission and coalition partners. So it's a very important function that DISA does do, especially in this age where cyber crime is uh, so important. Um, that we protect ourselves from. Um, next slide. Um, so this is, you know, I have provided a link to the strategic plan, uh, but for me, when I was going through it, I thought it was really important in, in terms of what they're saying, that they have to evolve the organization design and the operating processes to align with the next generation capabilities and defend 
uh, you know, our country, a nation against the new cyberspace threats that are constantly evolving. Um, so when you start looking at their objectives, the first one is prioritizing command and control. And this really includes modernizing the uh, Dodin backbone, network consolidation, cyberspace operations uh, to really drive incident avo avoidance and rapid response. It also includes state-of-art IT capability to nation's leaders and maximizing their effectiveness um, as <clears throat> the nation's combat support agency. The second objective, which was drive force readiness through innovation, is truly focused on implementing the next generation technology to help DISA and ready DISA to address the future fight. And DISA actually believes that a lot of this success is going to come through their partnerships with industry and academia and the use of innovative acquisition strategy. The, their third objective was leveraging data, um, you know, focusing on creating a more data centric culture. As, as we all know, uh, properly collected data does help in accelerating innovation and um, improved service delivery. So that is one of their objectives. Their fourth objective is harmonizing the cybersecurity and user experience, which truly is to uh, explore the various ways to operate in a secure information environment while creating an optimal user experience. And um, zero trust security and network architecture is actually part of this objective. And the last one, which actually I really, really like, was empowering the workforce, uh, creating a culture of trust, uh, recruiting high caliber candidates, um, and empowering um, excellence by removing the barriers that inhibit best value. So I really, I, that's the one I like the most. But uh, it's really nice to actually see the strategic objectives of an agency, um, because I think that sort of helps us when we start looking at the spend, it helps us really understand an agency and then sort of focus on how do we work with the agency and create our opportunities there. So the link to the strategic plan is in the slide, so please do feel free to use it, um, because I found it very helpful as I was getting ready for this presentation. Next slide. Um, could could we have the next slide? Sorry. Um, okay, so I, I guess I had a little bit of a delay. So in FY21, um, DISA actually awarded $6 billion to less than 1,000 companies. This was a drop from the previous year of one point, a drop of almost $1.7 billion. In terms of your top NAICS codes, no surprises. We see all the computer-related NAICS codes, uh, you know, uh, and, and engineering services and telecommunication services, because that's really, you know, the type of work that DISA does do. Again, when I'm looking at the top uh, prime contractors, we will see all the large ones, including LIDOS, Dell, Microsoft, or your top companies, General Dynamics, very much in the mix. So, you know, no surprises when you start looking at the prime contractors. Um, could I have the next slide? Um, what was interesting for me when I was looking at this uh, was the fact that they actually, uh, that 27% of contracts were awarded as small business, which is great. Um, you can also look at the types of set-asides that might have been used as you sort of analyzing contracts, especially if you are a small business or um, are in any of the socioeconomic uh, uh, categories. So this is just a quick look at that. Um, next slide. In terms of the small business uh, that, you know, 20, that DISA did award 27% of contracts to, uh, in terms of dollar value, it was 1.6 billion, and that went to about 633 companies. So, 
it's sort of, you know, it's always interesting to, to see the 80-20 principle, um, which is uh, pretty uh, clear when I'm looking at 633 companies that won about 27% of the, the contract. So, and again, in terms of set asides within the small business categories, um, you know, the bulk of the contracts were set aside as a small business. So that is, again, really good to understand and know. But you do see, and this is really nice to see that, um, you know, contracts were even set aside for women owned small businesses. So it's, and that, and it, it's not a small amount, it's like almost $46 million. So again, good to always see these, uh, how set asides are being used by various agencies. Uh, the next slide. So when I'm further looking at the small businesses, uh, you can again see that while we have the top next codes of computer uh, related services and systems, uh, you now see that there is a component of R&D that comes into the top next codes. And uh, again, you know, that is nice to see, especially in the small business category. Um, you could also see your top small businesses, uh, which include, uh, you know, VAE, counter trade products, FCN. Um, so it's a nice mix of companies right there. Um, and yeah, and the next slide. Um, I also, you know, with, with the COVID and the pandemic, I find it interesting to also point out the contracts that have been awarded uh, under the National Interest Action Code. And for DASA, the last year, only less than $2 million was awarded. So I think this is the lowest amount that I've seen, but it sort of makes sense when you think about the objective and what the agency is really doing. So it sort of ties in. Um, what I did want to point out is, so when you think about one of the objectives that I did talk about of, uh, you know, uh, creating partnerships and using innovative acquisition strategies, last year, DISA awarded uh, 44, almost $44 million as other transaction agreements. Um, so that was interesting for me to see. You have the link to the report there and nine companies won these contracts. So again, ties in with their objectives and using innovative acquisition strategies. Um, next slide. So one of the other things that I'm always going to say and, and tell companies to look at is let's, let's understand how is an agency or a bureau or a component purchasing by all the various contracting offices. Because again, it gives you an idea of where the funding is, which agencies are winning, um, you know, awarding the work, who's winning the work, allows you to get into a more detailed analysis. Uh, so this is just to give you a quick look of how the spend has been across, uh, you know, the past three and a half years um, by all the various contracting offices at DISA. Uh, so next slide. And if you've heard me before, you know, I'm always going to say that uh, we need to start looking at spend by categories and categories are really following the GSA's category uh, management, which is based off uh, PSE codes. And as you can see, I like to show this and see this because it allows me to get at a quick look at how the spend is going to small versus other than small businesses. Um, ID, professional services, R&D, facilities and construction are all your top uh, categories. And I would say DISA is doing a good job of making sure that contracts are going to small businesses. So. I wanted to, you know, have always have a look at the categories too, because a lot of times as we start, you know, the more data that we start looking at, sometimes um, the categories are, you know, when, you, when you're doing keyword searches and things like that, have a look at the categories too and, and see what comes up because uh, it's, it's a nice way of getting a better understanding of how the agencies are purchasing. So next slide. And then, of course, my favorite, right? I mean, keeping in mind category management and strategic uh, sourcing, how is an agency purchasing uh, on all the various vehicles that are out there? Um, so NASA SIP 5, NCORE 3, CIO SP 3, 
8 a stars alliance small business all of these vehicles are how uh, DISA is purchasing um, and I've sort of given you for comparison FY20 and FY21 numbers what can and of course keep in mind that these uh, vehicles will change if you start putting in a keyword, putting in a socioeconomic category. So always play with those to see how is an agency purchasing on the vehicles. It will help you strategize and understand which age, uh, which of these vehicles you might want to get on if there's, uh, you know, if it opens up or which are the companies that you want to create that teaming or subcontracting relationship with, especially if your solution is something that uh, the SAC can use and, you know, being on these vehicles definitely helps. So always pay attention to understanding all the various vehicles that an agency is using. Um, next slide, please. So once we understand how an agency is purchasing, looking at their strategic plan, understanding the players, uh, you know, it gets to be, uh, we, we need to get into understanding um, what are the opportunities. Um, so opportunities can be, you know, we have to understand that it could be based on the new initiatives, hence understanding the strategic plan, the budget of an agency gets to be very important. Um, and then also understanding what are the contracts that are expiring that could possibly be recompeted. So how do you get this information? Um, look at the budget and program information. Uh, this has done an amazing job of their, uh, in terms of their budget and proje projects and initiatives and in making it public. Look at the sources sought, look at the pre-solicitations that might get released in SAM.gov, uh, you know, at the agency level, at the bureau level, respond to them. Um, it is very, you know, for us, when because we work with both federal agencies and uh, government contractors, a lot of times I've heard my agency clients tell me that, hey, you know, we, we just don't get that response to RFIs that we want to get. Uh, and I think we as small businesses need to keep in mind that when an RFP or when it's a pre-solicitation or source of sort, it is the agency's way of doing market research. So we really want to make sure that we respond to them. And then, of course, let's create expiring contract searches. And, you know, it should really be based on your core competency. It's important that we focus on what our Come, you know, what is it that we are selling? What is our solution? What is the problem that we're going to help the agency achieve? Uh, that is what our focus is. And, and then, you know, use our understanding of all the various agencies uh, to um, uh, create, you know, work with our agencies. So create expiring contracts. If you are on an IDIQ or GVAC or BPA, then look at the task orders that are expiring on these vehicles too. Um, so let's look at DISA. Next slide, please. So when I looked at the contracts that are expiring at DISA over the last 12 months, and I broke it up into two categories. So uh, this, this first one is just looking at other than small business. Um, we have $4.4 billion in contracts that were awarded. Uh, that are expiring in the next 12 months. Um, so again, a lot of computer related services. We have some wire telecommunication carrier services all expiring in the next 12 months. Um, if you go to the next slide, we've uh, actually listed out the top 10 uh, contracts that are expiring with the dollar value of all the expiring contract, uh, expiring contracts, uh, Cisco, Verizon, Microsoft, uh, all very much part of the top 10 companies where contracts are expiring. Uh, next slide. Let's look at the contracts that are expiring for small businesses. So $1.4 billion in contracts expire next in the next 12 months. Again, when, I, when you start looking at your top NAICS codes, we have, of course, our computer-related services uh, and NAICS codes. We also have some uh, facility management services, uh, satellite telecommunication services, and administrative services, all expiring in the next 12 months. 
when you start looking at how these contracts that are expiring were set aside, look at your 8A sole sources and the hub zone set aside and the women on business set aside, um, especially if you are in these socioeconomic indicators, focus on those, see when they're expiring, or actually also just look at the small business set aside and see if you're a woman owned business, can, that, can some of those contracts be set aside as a woman owned small business? Um, but if you are an 8A, uh, uh, look at do do contract searches based on when that specific a based on a day expiration date because now you can see the companies that have contracts that are expiring that have a relationship with an agency and also have an expiring a day you could possibly look at working with those companies and creating those relationships and you know the teaming relationships and joint ventures um, and things like that so Again, looking at expiring contracts really gets to be very important. Next slide. And here is a list of all the top 10 uh, contracts that are expiring in the next 12 months that were awarded as a uh, small business. And you will again see a lot of uh, familiar companies uh, right here. And next slide. So opportunities, uh, you know, this is just a quick look at the top uh, opportunities that were out there for DISA. Uh, but save your searches, follow opportunities, whether you're using SAM.gov or another service such as uh, FedMine or whichever one that you use, um, respond to them, save them, track them, uh, you know, just uh, very important for us to do that. Um, next slide. So when we look at all the opportunities, creating the plans, creating the relationships, understanding the objectives, it's just putting it all together that helps a company grow and be focused in all their development efforts. Uh, I did have a look at DISA's budget. It is very detailed. Again, I've provided you with links to their budget and their forecasted opportunities. Um, they currently have a budget of about $12 billion. And interestingly, which I didn't know, I learned a lot doing my research on this at this time, um, they receive funding from both congressional appropriations of about $3.5 billion and also from the Defense Working Capital Fund. Um, and then when you start going through the budget, it's very interesting and not surprising to see that all the projects that they are looking at are very much in line with their mission. So, uh, you know, that was something that it, it is really good to look at. Um, and, you know, I mean, I just picked up things like for FY21, you know, they have a cyberspace request budget for about $530 million. Uh, you know, they have an uh, R&D uh, request for about less than um, you know, $378 million, which is less than the previous years. So those are things that you can actually look at based on the type of work that you do and put that on top of the contracting data, put that on top of that expiring contract search, and now you have, you have the ability to create a, a strategy to grow your business. So um, thanks, thanks, uh, Colton. Um, you all have access to my email, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And now we can look at the perspective from the federal government. Thank you, Archiza. And uh, as I noted earlier, uh, we were unable to get our contact uh, to come in and speak today from DISA. So I'm going to go through a couple of slides with some useful links and then read over some best practices from DISA. So right here is a link to the main agency department for DISA and a link to the small business office. Uh, a link to the acquisition forecast is provided below, and a link to the SBA scorecard is provided here. Additionally, a link to events and industry days uh, is provided on this slide. And again, these links will be provided uh, in the PowerPoint slides after this presentation. And some best practices of doing, for doing business with DISA. Do your homework. Know what DISA buys and how DISA buys it. And determine if and how your capabilities fit into DISA's mission. Number three, understand federal contracting processes. Number four, explore subcontracting and joint venture teaming opportunities. Number five, respond to source notices or requests for information on SAM.gov. 
Number six, make sure your data is up to date in the SBA Dynamic Small Business Search tool and fully details your business and its capabilities. And number seven, know the barriers to entry. And provided below is a specific web page on DISA on how to do business as a small business. Uh, and here is our point of contact, uh, Carlin Capenos, Director of the Office Small Business Program at DISA. Uh, and now we will move into uh, M&A activities within top contractors. Paul, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, my name is Paul Powell. I'm glad to be here. Um, I joined the McLean Group in January of this year, and I am one of the managing directors and co-lead of our defense government or DGI practice. Previously, I worked with Devell in its transition to full and open with their initial acquisition of MSC, and then subsequently their sale to Macquarie Capital. Most recently, I helped uh, CDP in the transition to full and open with its acquisition of Atlas Research. Um, prior, I, was, I led corporate development at TAS right up till its merger with Agility. So, you know, I've had to, the privilege to work with some extraordinarily phenomenal people, and I look forward to the opportunity to possibly connecting with many of you as you push forward with your plans and strategies. Next slide. So about the McLean Group, you know, we serve, we've been serving the industry for over 25 years, and we've kept our culture as an agile, dynamic boutique investment bank and financial services firm in all areas of government services, including physical and cybersecurity, critical infrastructure, as well as commercially focused business, including maritime transport and facilities. We have over 60 professionals spreading our two main practices of investment banking and business valuations which we can draw on both a great deal of creative and market sophistication, as well as at the depth of expertise and resources to achieve our clients' objectives. In addition to our two core practices, we also have on distinct and select transactions participated as a capital partner. In summary and by the numbers, since 2010, we've done over 6 billion transactions, which include both buy side capital raises, in addition to the additional sell side practice as all investments are known, our investment banks are known for. Last year, we completed over 400 valuation engagements. And if you don't know, we actually have one of the largest valuation practices in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, last year, we had, again, over 400 engagements at any one time. We concurrently you know, have about 350 engagement valuation engagements in our, in our pipeline. And these engagements include PPAs, or you know, purchase price allocations, fairness opinions, and other valuation work and we've participated in about six growth capital investments. Next slide. <clears throat> so what has happened and what is happening in the market? As, as I'm sure many of you've heard, if you've attended any seminars or any conferences uh, towards the end of last year and so in the beginning of this year, everyone will tell you last year, uh, 2021 saw a record number of transactions spanning companies serving our natural interests from the national labs to the SEC, from DISA to HRSA, from coast to coast, from founder owners to established juggernauts. Among the top strategic buyers, they averaged three acquisitions. And among the top um, financial buyers, they averaged six transactions last year. So really busy, a lot of buyers and a lot of opportunities. And, you know, uh, you know, inv uh, investment banks like ours and, you know, we, you know, we unfortunately had to had to, you know, be very selective and who we engaged simply because there were so many opportunities out there. Um, and those that weren't able to be engaged last year are spilling over to this year. So this year is also looking pretty active. Um, and whether this year exceeds last year, you know, we're still pretty much in the first two months. So it has yet to be seen. But uh, if activity out there is any indication, it's going to be pretty close. Some notable transactions with companies that have work or specifically focused in DISA and its capabilities um, include, most recently, uh, Gunnison's acquisition, and this is Gunnison's third acquisition in 15 months of Centerpoint, uh, and you know, and with Centerpoint, Gunnison gains DISA as, as, as a client. There was IntelliBridge's acquisition of U-Group, and with that acquisition, it enhanced its capabilities at DISA, which represents about 75% of, uh, of IntelliBridge's work at OSD. Then there was ECS's acquisition of Indrasaw to expand its already deep relationship at DISA. Then, you know, Octo's acquisition of Indrasaw, of, I'm sorry, Aquasactors, and this was 
Octo's third acquisition since 2019 of Volant, allowing it uh, a $7.5 billion SETI IDIQ with DISA through 2029. Then there was Pluralox, uh, which is a Canadian company, by the way, acquisition of Aurora in a cash and stock deal after a spike in Aurora at Air Force, Navy, and specifically at DISA. Finally, there was Swish Data Corp's acquisition, its second in two years, of Titania Solutions Group. And Titania Solutions Group was a 100-person firm that counts DISA amongst its top five customers. So really an active space. Uh, DISA, you know, at, at, as was noted earlier, is, is a very in-demand agency, um, has, a, has a very, you know, robust budget. Um, and a lot of companies, you know, are there looking to gain a beachhead and expand from there or simply enhance and gain more real estate within the within that agency through acquisition. So acquisition, you know, has been and remains a, a very fast um, and, and uh, you know, inorganic, obviously inorganic way to gain, to get into DESA. Uh, next slide. So here, you know, you've probably seen this slide previously and, you know, what drives value and what creates and what creates and what is considered value. I'm going to take a slightly different perspective than, than you might have heard in the past. Um, you know, so like, you know, this slide is you've seen in various permutations, um, but I'd like to focus on concepts three and four specifically. And, and the reason why it's concept one can be considered general market tone and no one company can really influence and almost every company are the benefits and result of market forces in concept one. And concept two, though generally more company specific, still has the following rule of thumb boilerplate characteristics. One, unrestricted is better than otherwise restricted or set aside. Two, prime is always best. Three, backlog, yes, yes, and yes. And recompete, you should generally have a win rate better than 75% for recompetes, right? So, you know, two generally, it's, it's those rule of thumbs. Um, and, and I would further assess that the above value is really derived from the strengths of concepts three and four. So let's go to concept three, core business fundamentals. What is your business? What capabilities are you marketing? Are these capabilities being priced as a commodity or real quote unquote capability? What is your vision, focus, and the team you've put together to achieve that vision? No company, no matter how big, can be good at everything. Obviously, the bigger you are, the more things you can be good at. But even then, you'll realize some assets, no matter how big you are, are not as good as other assets that, uh, that you're engaged in. And so you're going to divert resources from the better assets to uh, from the, the less good assets to the better assets. And eventually you'll find that the less good assets become orphaned assets. And eventually you may decide to divest those orphaned assets to a better home, right? And, and I think this year you'll, you'll probably see some news releases and, and some, uh, some announcements that some of the large you know, companies out there will be divesting some of their non-core assets. I like to turn them the orphaned assets and focus on their core assets simply because it's a better use of resources for them to focus on those because they get the higher margins, the longer the longer contract terms, uh, and the deeper customer intimacy with those particular capabilities. And you know, in general, really valuable companies focus on a few things or one thing in particular and become market leaders or go-to resources for those things. You know. Um, you know, take for example, GE was a well-diversified company way back when, but look at it now, it's pretty much shed up many of its non-core assets and gone back to brass tacks and focused on its core assets. So that brings us to number four, the fourth concept, specialization and differentiation. I think specialization part overlaps you know, overlaps the focus aspects as, as we talked about in concept three above. Differentiation. Well, everybody knows the old adage that imitation is the highest form of, clap, of flattery. Well, it's true, right? If you're onto something great, the market will try to copy you and offer similar things that will set that, that will, will you know they're going to try to offer similar thing and compete with you on price. And eventually, 
you know, what you thought was something great becomes a commodity type asset, right? So what really separates you apart and, and you know, separates that activity apart from the rest of the market is really, you know, it goes without saying how well you do it, how efficiently you do it, how institutionalized you've made it. Institutionalized means that, you know, you've instituted a practice or a methodology that, you know, doesn't go home every night. It stays with the company. And so, you know, there's no one person that is, you know, the key person to making it happen. It is, it is, com it is your company specific. It's repeatable, but it's unique to you. It's otherwise, you know, for lack of a better phrase, it's your secret sauce, right? And, you know, finally, it's, it's kind of the, the punchline, right? How well you do, what is the, how much better in terms of outcome efficacy are you achieving for the client than the next competitor over there? The better you create outcomes for the client, obviously, the more valuable you are to that client and generally the more valuable you are to the market. And, you know, if in the event you decide to exit, then, you know, the more valuable you are to a potential suitor or acquirer. Next slide. So these value drivers, I'm not going to spend too much time over the next two slides. Um, you know, these value drivers, you know, statistics and math are one of those things where you can always massage the numbers and, and you know, talk about various parts of statistics that always favor you. So, you know, I think of these statistical drivers or these numbers as directionally notional. So I'll, but I will higher, highlight some that I think may be misconstrued um, and, and just dive a little deeper into them. So the first one I'm gonna look at is leverage and liquidity. The, the last one in the top table up top. So first let's look at leverage. You know, I think leverage, a lot of people, leverage is how much debt you're carrying, how much money you're borrowing. And, and a lot of people, you know, especially smaller companies, founder owner companies, companies that are just starting off or companies that, you know, haven't really been in the capital market space. The, even large companies as large as $200 million that are, that have grown from, you know, founder owners to, to, uh, you know, a good, uh, strong manager team are simply afraid of debt. And I would like to dispel that notion. I'd like to think that debt or leverage is your friend. In fact, I'd go to as far to say as that for most good, healthy companies, if they had to choose between gaining additional capital through selling equity or gaining additional capital through issuance of debt, almost every day to Sunday and then again for Sunday dinner, they would choose debt than giving up equity. For good, healthy companies, equity is always, always more expensive in terms of the value you're giving for debt. And just to give you the math behind it, if your company is growing at 10% a year, your equity is essentially generating a 10% return a year, right? Whereas for debt, you may be paying only interest of maybe in, in this environment, you know, up to five, maybe 7% a year. So, you know, by giving up equity, you're actually giving up an additional 3% of growth than you that you otherwise would be keeping inside the company. And then on liquidity, well, liquidity, it's true. Any person who's taking account of force will tell you companies with accessible cash will outsurvive those with no access to cash. However, you know, there is a nuance there. And in this case, you know, what's what's talked about here is working capital. Working capital typically is defined as current assets, less current liabilities. Uh, and in general, you know, the larger the working capital, the better, meaning the, 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 the greater the assets to your liabilities, the better position you are. However, you know, if you're going to exit or any any type of transaction, especially in the government services space, most transactions are what we call uh, zero debt, zero cash, right? So that means your working capital doesn't include your cash, nor does it include your debt. So in most cases, working capital and the larger component of it will be the difference between your AR and your AP. And depending on billing cycles, time of year, and a myriad of other factors, that difference can be positive, small, zero, and even negative. 
and in a, in, a, in, a, in a transaction where you're exiting the company or merging with that company in a GovCon space, that really becomes not such a big deal as long as between the time you define your working capital, the time you close, it stays steady, right? So finally, you know, let's touch on um, nature of services. And I believe, yeah, uh, that's on the next slide. So nature of services, you know, I think this, this really goes to concept three and four uh, earlier. And, and if we take 900 out of 1,000 contractors or government services firm, um, you know, every one, 900 of them of that 1,000 will argue their services are higher. No one's going to ever say, oh, you know, my, my service is kind of road. It's, 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 it's run of the mill. It's plain vanilla. It, you know, it's nothing special. You know, I would I had never encountered a company that says their service is like that. Um, even if their company is just simply mowing lawns uh, or or taking care of laundry on on some on some faraway base overseas or in some in some national lab in the U.S., they will always tell you their service is special. It's high end. No one can duplicate what they're doing. You know, it's the best there is. You know, far none. It, it is it is the bee's knees of services. They'll all tell you that, right? But high end is like beauty, right? It's in the eye of the beholder and or the buyer, and sometimes how well and sometimes you know whatever service it is it can be presented and storyboarded really well and depending on how well it's presented and storyboarded regardless it can be it can have the appearance of something that's truly significant when it really may not be truly significant but whatever service you're doing what can't be easily changed whether your services are really you know again you know and I, you know taking care of taking care of a physical plant or taking care of a, of, of you know laundry for example what can't be changed is and and you know and you and regardless of who is looking is how well it fits into concepts three and four right so regardless of what you're doing if you truly are the best at it and you truly are you know have have a great grasp of it and can do it more efficiently can do it better at cheaper costs and come up with better customer efficacy and outcomes for your client, you will be considered, that service will be highly valued regardless of where you are in that value pyramid. Whether you're at the top of the value pyramid or whether you're at the bottom of the value pyramid, if you can truly say, hey, I actually do this the best, I, have, I can do it at the, at, at the most efficient cost, and by the way, I can deliver the outcome better than anyone else out there for my client, you'll get the greatest value for that particular service. Um, and, and with that, you know, I'll, I'll say thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. And I hope you, uh, you found this informative. Thank you, Paul. And thank you to our speakers and everyone who attended the presentation today. The recording and slides will be available by close of business on Monday. And we look forward to seeing you next week as we cover doing business with DLA.